Thanks for joining us this weekend. My name is Jesse. I am uh, one of the campus pastors here at Northview, and it is good to be with you this weekend. It is Father's Day uh, this weekend as well, and if there's dads tuning in out there, we want to wish you a big happy right Father's Day. I was so excited about Father's Day that I actually invited my dad to join me. Uh, yeah. You might know him as Pastor Vic from the care department. Dad, this is for you. Ha! Huh. Thanks, Jess. A uh, card? No, it's not a card. It's your script. You need to make a announcement about children's ministry. Oh, yeah. thanks. Okay. Anyway, yes, thanks for letting me be a part of this, Jess. One of the highlights for me as a pastor at church is seeing all of the young kids that are coming each week to learn about Jesus, and my grandkids are in part of that. So it makes me extra excited to let you know that there's a CM video for the kids each week. And so you want to head there today to see what they have for you. Right on. It's also a new member weekend at Northview, and we would normally have you stand up and we'd cheer and clap and, and pray for you. But it's not a normal weekend here at Northview, so right. unfortunately we can't do that. Membership at, at Northview involves us as a church encouraging you in your discipleship to attend regularly, to join a community group, mm -hmm. uh, to serve and to give. But it's also an opportunity for members to say, hey, I'm committed to the mission and the vision of Northview Church to make disciples. Yeah. Dad, how many people do you think joined membership in this last season? Hmm, well, let's see. I know there were some weebs, some hebers. Okay, let's, um, let's not play the Mennonite game. It was over a hundred, over a hundred people joined cool. and we're gonna have their names scroll either up or, or down and, and that's what we'll do for them. And uh, Brendan nice. Kuhn, who hey, invited him? Them. That's, hey, the Westerbergs, I know them. Yeah, Neighbors, right. yeah, nice. okay. Mary Lamblin from Mission Campus. Great to have you on the team, that's great. Okay, well, moving Arnold along. Arnold uh, incredible. Okay, and moving nice. along. Yes, we have something else that we want you to be aware of, the virtual congregational meeting, which is gonna be online. So whether you're an old member or a new member, you get a chance to register for that. You gotta go online and sign up. Nothing says welcome to Northview like exclusive access to a virtual congregational <laughs> meeting. Unfortunately, during this time, we can only offer this meeting to members. So if you're a member, we do encourage you uh, to tune into that. And another thing we would like you to be aware of is the Hey Neighbor campaign, which is going on in our community. It's been begun by another church. We as North, you want to partner with them and seeing how we can help our local food bank. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a number of things we're going to do. And Jesse, how do they get involved with that? Yeah, so, so on June 27th, you can come to the Downs Road campus and pick up uh, some paper bags that we want to have filled up and, and give to the food bank. But you don't have to do all the filling yourselves. You can actually, the, the goal is to mm -hmm. hand these out to your neighbors so that they would participate and join in this initiative to, to love and care for our community. If you have any more questions, which you likely do about this campaign, I encourage you to go to our website, northview.org, and click on the button titled Care Initiative. And I think they've heard enough from us now, so it's time to join Pastor Frank and his team as they lead us in worship. Here we go. Good job, Pops. Proud of you. reading today is from Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord.
Within my heart Is a melody that was not taught In the darkest night it still goes on The anthem of my God Within my heart Is a treasure that cannot be bought When all else is faded it will not The anthem of my God
Thank you, Frank and the team, for that. We're now going to join Pastor Jeff as he continues our sermon series through the book of Esther. So if you have your Bible, grab it, turn to Esther chapter 6. I spent a little bit of time over the last few weeks uh, re-watching some old movies with my wife and my kids. My children have started to be interested in some of those 80, 80s movies like Back to the Future and stuff that, that we used to like when we were kids. Watching a movie a second time is, is an interesting experience though, or maybe the fifth time. It's a very interesting experience because um, you, you know when everything's going to be going bad in, in the story and when, there's a, when, when the turn comes. And by the turn, I mean when everything's hit rock, rock bottom and then the rest of the film pick, picks up, right? That story arc is really common in, in most films. Um, what's interesting is when you're watching it a second time, my, my wife will often say, I, can we fast forward through this part? And this part is usually the bad part, the part where things are going all wrong for the characters. Can we fast forward through this part so we can get to the turn? So we can get to the, to the happy part, to the part where everything starts going, going right for them? This portion of the book of Esther is, is the turn. Esther chapter 6 is where the story goes from being most things going bad for the characters that we love, Mordecai and Esther, and things are going good for the bad guy, Haman. And then the tables are turned. And so this is a lovely, funny chapter in the book of Esther to get you up to speed to where we've been, um, Mordecai. Uh, a Jew who, who sits at the king's gate, which means that he's, a, he's an official working in the king's government, he won't bow to the second-in-command guy in the entire empire, a guy named Haman. And Haman has everybody else bowing to him, but Mordecai won't do it, and that makes him so angry. Haman can't stand this, and so instead of just saying, I want to get this Mordecai guy dead, he says, no, I want to get this Mordecai guy and all of his people, all the Jews, dead. So we've got a, a real live holocaust on our hands here. He goes to the king, Xerxes, and Haman gets permission to kill this group of people. The king doesn't know, in fact, that it's the Jews that he's given permission to kill. Haman just said there's a people group in the empire who are real bad guys. Can I have permission to kill them all? And the king's like, hey, whatever, Haman, as long as I don't have to think about it, it's good. So Haman sends out a notice to all the 127 provinces of the kingdom and says on this particular day, everybody gets to go and loot their Jewish neighbor's house and kill their Jewish neighbor. Of course, this is a great terror and a great um, a, a moment for mourning for a guy like Mordecai, who starts to wail, puts on sackcloth, and he sits in ashes, and he wails before the king's gate, trying to get the attention of the king. Instead, he gets attention from the queen, his daughter's cousin, who he raised as a daughter. And she says, what's going on? He tells her, look, all the Jews are in great trouble, and you're in a position where you can step in and make a change. You can step in and approach the king and make everything uh, uh, right if you can appeal to him and have him change his mind. Esther says, well, I can't go to the king un uh, unannounced. I can't go without an invitation, and if I do, I might die. And Mordecai tells her, listen, we are all going to die, and maybe you've been placed in this situation for just such a time as this. And then there's that famous phrase in the book of Esther where Esther says, all right, you guys pray for me. I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Well, she goes to the king. He extends his gold scepter, showing that he doesn't want to kill her, and she has a plan. Her plan is to invite Haman and the king to a banquet. She has the banquet. Haman goes away, kind of feeling himself a little bit, right? He's super excited about the fact that he's been the only one who's been invited to the king's uh, banquet with the queen. But he's still angry at this Mordecai, because when he walks down the street, everybody else honors him, but Mordecai will not. And so he says, fine, this is ridiculous. I'm going to get to the point now. Not only am I going to have the Jews killed later, I'm going, to, I'm going to go and get permission to have an advanced killing of Mordecai the Jew. So he constructs this massive pole to impale Mordecai on just outside of Haman's house. The pole is seriously seven and a half stories high. 
He's going to impale Mordecai at the very top of this pole, and you're going to be able to see that from all around. And that's where we pick up chapter 6. Everything's going wrong. Mordecai is on the verge of death. Esther doesn't know if a request is going to be it is going to be granted, and the people in the empire, the Jewish people in the empire, just think that they're going to be, they're going to die. And then, the turn. This is a great chapter, chapter 6, Esther. I want to give you an outline of what we're going to do in the next few minutes. Uh, I just want to tell you the story, and then I want to give you three implications of the story. All right, so here we go. Esther chapter 6, verse 1. That night, the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Well, nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. Okay, so there's a few things I need to point your attention to. Uh, the first is that the king can't sleep. Uh, Haman's been building this pole all night long, and meanwhile, at the kingdom, in the palace, there is, there is Xerxes, and he's lying in his bed, and normally he can sleep, but apparently on this particular night, he can't. We don't know why. Maybe it's because he's wondering what Esther's gonna ask him. She had already said, listen, uh, I've had this first banquet, but my request is that tomorrow you, you guys will come back to another banquet with, you know, with me and just the king and Haman, and I will tell you what it is that I want. Maybe he's, he's wondering, have I forgotten something? Have I wronged her in some way? What is it she wants? I don't know. But you know what it's like when your mind starts worrying in the middle of the night about something you've been thinking about a little bit? You're looking for a way to get to sleep. All you want to do is, is sleep. Um, guy came up to me a little while ago and he told me that uh, he really enjoys my sermons, not just for the sermons themselves, he said, but I play them to my children at night so that they can get some sleep, which I found very um, encouraging, I suppose. <laughs> but we're always looking for something, something boring to put us, back, put us back to sleep. Well, the king's got something boring and it's called the book of the Chronicles. In other words, it's a retelling of all the stuff that has happened during Xerxes' reign. And he's probably having somebody read it in a monotone voice so that he can fall asleep, first because it's massively boring, but second because it tells all the victories that Xerxes has done and perhaps that will lead to grand dreams for him. This guy is really full of himself. He's already shown off the whole kingdom to all the nobles and had huge parties and stuff to show people his wealth and influence. So he wants to hear the stories of how great he was read to him as he, as he just drifts off into, into dreamland. But as that book is being read, a part comes to him. It's read out loud about this Mordecai who had exposed Big Thana and Teresh, who were two uh, men who had committed treason. And nothing had been done for him. You remember, if you've been following through this, you remember at the end of chapter 2, that's exactly what happened. This little, this little story is, is included almost out of nowhere about how Mordecai's at the front gate and he overhears at the gate of the, gate of the, the king's gate and he overhears uh, Big Thana and Teresh planning an assassination. And so he reports it to Esther who reports it to the king and those guys are, are caught and they, are, they face the death penalty but nothing had been done for him. Now that's a big deal. It's a big deal because Xerxes likes to think of himself as, as a generous man. He's the kind of guy who always repays a good deed with liberal overflow, many gifts. And yet here's a guy who saved his life and has got nothing. Now this, word of this gets out. Then nobody will think that he's generous. In fact, they'll think that he's kind of entitled, kind of uh, foolish, and his name will be besmirched, and so he's got to fix this problem. But he, he's gonna be interrupted. Verse four, the king said, well, who's in the court? 
Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had just set up for him. His attendants answered, Well, Haman, standing in the court, bring him in, the king ordered. And when Haman entered, the king asked him, What should be done, Haman, for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, uh, Who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have him bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest on its head. And then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. So Haman is there in the king's court. Early in the morning, remember, the, uh, the king has been trying to get to sleep and have this book read to him overnight. And then he's interrupted. So this must be sometime very early in the morning. Haman has shown up. He is ready to make his request to kill Mordecai and paling him on that massive pole that he has built overnight at his house. He gets there before anybody else is there. The king recognizes that there's somebody in the court. They determine that it's Haman. Now... Haman uh, is asked what should be done here. That's normal for the king to ask his, his highest advisors. You've seen in other parts of this book, whenever he has to make a big decision about whether he's going to kick Vashti out or whatever, he goes to his advisors and he asks for their advice. Haman is his chief advisor, and so he's, he's asking him, all right, maybe I could ask him about what I should do for Mordecai, but he doesn't use Mordecai's name. He said, I want to honor someone, someone I care a lot about. What should I do, Haman, for the man I want to honor? Now, Haman, he's pretty full of himself. <laughs> he thinks, listen, it, who else in the kingdom gets to have uh, a meal with just the king and the queen? Like, th th he can ask anyone in all of Persia to come and join them for a meal. And they ask me. So who's the most honored guy around? Haman's thinking, it's got, it's got to be me. And so he repeats the phrase, who is it the king delights to honor? And he just, it's almost in Hebrew, it sort of just sits there like he's dwelling on it. It's, who is it the king delights to honor? Well, and then he goes for it. Well, uh, I think what you should do for the, the one the king delights to honor I think, I think what you should do is you should give him a, 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 a royal robe that the king has worn. And I think you should also give him a royal horse that the king has ridden. And on that horse, I want you to, you, what you should do is you should put the crest on it. That word actually is crown. And that means that the, the horse would, they would tie the horse's mane up in a particular way. So it kind of stuck up between its ears. It was a signal that the, that the man riding the horse was the king. It's the way they went into battle or they went into processions and stuff. This is the king's horse because it's got the particular crown on it. King's robe, king's horse, signified by the, by the king, the, the crown on the horse, and you should get one of the most noble princes, one of the most highest ranking officers anywhere in the kingdom. And you should have them hold the, the reins of that horse and lead this man, the one the, 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 one the king delight, delights to honor. You should lead this man through the entire city streets and have him it proclaimed by the, the noble leading the horse that this is what the king does for those he delights to honor. Just feel Haman getting more and more excited about how this request is going to come true for him. And the king thinks, well, this is a pretty good idea. I mean, essentially what Haman is asking for here, is he says, listen, can, the, one you want, the one you delight to honor, can he just be king for a day? And in that moment that he's being led around, he actually will outrank everyone else in the kingdom. He will outrank especially the one who's leading him. The high noble, he, he, he will outrank that person. So can I, can I be king for a day? Verse 10. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. 
get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you've recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. You can imagine how horrified this man is. This is one of those moments where, I don't know if you've, you've thought something was going to go one way and then someone announces something different and you say, wait, what? Just, wait, wait a minute, what? You can imagine Haman's face drop as he hears Mordecai's name. The very Mordecai that he had come early to the palace to ask if he could be impaled is now going to be riding on the king's horse, be king for the day, and outrank the one who's leading him, who will be Haman. This is a delicious, delicious moment. Mordecai is going to outrank Haman himself. You can imagine that walk, can't you? <laughs> While Haman is walking him through the town. I mean, if, I mean, if I were Mordecai sitting on the back of that horse, given all the things that had happened at this point, and Haman is announcing it, I, I, I can't help but think that Haman might be not announcing it quite as loudly as he would had it been somebody else on the back of the horse. Here's the one the king delights to honor. If I were Mordecai, I'd be like, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I don't think the people up in the, up in the buildings can hear you, Haman. I would giggle. What a delicious turn of events. You know, the Jewish history includes some uh, probably untrue, but uh, traditions about this, uh, about this particular scene. One of the traditions is that when, when Haman was leading Mordecai through the streets, Haman's daughter saw from a balcony where they lived, Haman's daughter saw from the balcony this man leading another man who's dressed as the king and on the king's horse through the city. And she thought, this must be Mordecai leading my father Haman through the streets of the city. And because she despised Mordecai so much because her father hated him so much, she took the chamber pot, you know, the, the chamber pot, <laughs> and, and dumped it on the head of the man leading the horse, thinking, of course, it was Mordecai. And when the chamber pot hit the head of Haman, Haman looked up, saw his daughter, and scolded her. She was so shocked to see her father being mocked publicly like this that she fell off the balcony and died. Like I said, probably not true, but it does give you an idea as to how shocking this would have felt for the people who had been seeing it. Well, the horse goes away. Eventually, Mordecai gets off. Verse 12, afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. And he told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And his, visor, his advisors and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, Look, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. He's got his head totally covered in grief, probably not just because he's sad, but he doesn't want anybody else to see him. His face has been shown before everybody else is the one leading Mordecai the Jew. He's been humiliated. So he covers his face. He gets home, probably in tears. He says, oh, my goodness, do you know what's happened? It's been terrible. Tells his wife, Zeresh, what's gone on. And he tells his advisors, those advisors, the actual language that's used to describe them is they are called the wise ones. They're actually fortune tellers. Every, every leader in the ancient world had a group of guys who would give them some indication as to what was going to happen in the future. The way that some of those guys would determine that was sometimes they'd cut open uh, uh, an animal and take the intestines of the animal and lay them out on a, 
lay, lay them out on a, on a table and determine from, from the shape of those intestines what was going to happen in the future. I, don't try that at home. It doesn't, apparently, I don't think it worked very well. But they, they were fortune tellers. They read the signs, in other words. And so when they read the signs of the coincidences that have taken place on this particular day, they turn to Haman and say, look, I think you might have got in, got in over your head here. I think that there's no way that you are going to overcome this guy. I, he's, he's a Jew. I think you've picked a fight with the wrong people. Before Haman can answer, he's rushed off to the banquet, the second banquet with Esther. And then the chapter ends, ends there. Look, this is a funny scene. It's remarkable in many ways. There's three, three implications that I want to give to you today from it. Here's the first of them. Number one, uh, I've titled it, It's All a God Thing. It's all a God thing. I don't know if you've noticed through this chapter the providences of God, just the weird little things that happened that made it so that the big thing, the leading of Mordecai through the streets could happen. Here's the little things that happened. Uh, Xerxes was sleepless. We, we don't know why. He just was sort of awake on this particular evening. He chose to have a book read. That book included the story about Mordecai in it, they got, he didn't fall asleep until the story of Mordecai was, was read. His interest was piqued at that particular time. The king had a commitment to his own name and reputation, causing him to desire to correct the oversight of not rewarding, of not rewarding uh, Mordecai. Uh, Haman's entrance at just the right moment in the king's court caused ultimately by his own wicked desires to ruin Mordecai, to impale him on a, on a pole that he had built all night. His desire to get there early in the morning to make sure that this could happen worked out just, just right. When the king was asking a question in his mind, his great advisor shows up so that he can ask him. Haman's arrogance, which is bolstered by Esther's invitation to the banquets, uh, he would have assumed the king was talking about him if he, he wouldn't have assumed that the king was talking about him if he wasn't smelling himself at that point. Like all of these things, these little things, these little desires, these little moments, these little sleeplessness, all of this stuff works perfectly together to lead to God's outcome. Whether it was big decisions or seemingly purposeless actions, God was working through it all to bring about his perfect goals. It's like there are a million different threads that look like we're completely out of whack. You didn't think that the little white thread that was sticking off to one side was going to form any important part of the tapestry, but then it's drawn together with all the others and you realize that it all had a purpose. All of it had a purpose. We say that it was a God thing. We usually use that language, by the way, for uh, the big things in life, don't we? Um, I remember a pastor telling me on one occasion that his, his child uh, got sick. He was from the United States. His child had gotten sick, and they needed to pay uh, a, a portion of the fee to see the doctor. Um, I think it was like $200 they had to pay. They didn't have it. They didn't have the money, but their child was sick. So he left his wife at the hospital with his, with, with his, his child, and he drove home, and he pled in tears, pled with God, you have to do something. You have to do something. I have no, I, you have to do something. He arrived home, noticed that there was something sticking out from the letterbox, opened the letterbox, and in it was a letter that apparently had been dated weeks before, but had gotten somehow lost in the mail. And in it was $200. When he told me the story, he, he marveled at the fact that, look, it, 
it's not just that it was there at that time, it's that weeks prior, this person has decided to mail a particular a letter with this particular amount of money to me, and then it gets lost in the mail for whatever reason. Some mail carrier drops it somewhere, or maybe it gets rerouted to another home, and then it goes back in the mail, and they get it there just at the moment that I needed it. God thing. That's what we call a God thing, right? Or the famous old story of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, who in its early days needed, needed $10,000 to stay in business, basically. And one of the great old preachers and teachers there, a guy named Harry Ironside, not a great name for a preacher, right, Dr. Ironside. He uh, was praying in a prayer meeting with, uh, with the other faculty and just said, honestly, Lord, I know you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, we need ten thousand dollars. So could you could you sell some of the cattle and give us the money? People chuckled. The prayer was over. Went back to the offices. That afternoon, a check came in the mail for ten thousand dollars. In it was a letter that was written from a rancher who said, "I had just sold my cattle, and this is a portion of the proceeds." I thought I'd give it to the seminary. <laughs> God thing, right? Those, are, of course, they are. We, we look at that and we say, yeah, those are totally God things, big things that happen. But what about all the little things that led to the big things happening? Were those God things? The left turns or the right turns that they took on the road or the mail carriers dropping it at a particular time or a guy selling his cattle at just that right time and getting just that right amount to send to just the right ministry who needed it at just the right time. All of those little pieces that led to the big God moments were also God moments. All of them. God moments. Even the decisions that some people make that are wicked and lead to, lead to horrible outcomes are still allowed by God to bring about his perfect purposes in the lives of those he loves. Listen, this is really important for you to hear. Whatever is happening around you is not out of control. Whatever is happening around you is not out of control. It might look out of control. It might feel out of control. It is not out of control. Even if our circumstances are the result of evil actions by wicked people, God allows nothing in your life that he will not use for your good. He allows nothing in your life that he will not use for your good. Even COVID, even the loss of a job, even an illness. It's all a God thing. Second thing that we learn here an implication of this passage is that God's plans for our good cannot be stopped. It's not just that Everything's a God thing and it's working for our good. Those plans cannot be stopped because the God who made them cannot be stopped from fulfilling them. There's nobody anywhere who can stop him. Isn't that essentially what is going on here? Esther 6, verse thir second part of 13. The advisors, right, the wise men and Zeresh, Haman's wife, basically say it out loud. They say, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, Haman, is of Jewish origin... You can't stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. You, you cannot stand against this guy. I don't know if you grew up in a, in a neighborhood that, uh, or a friend where you had friends, uh, especially if you were, little, you were a little boy, you had friends who had older brothers, and you'd get in a tussle maybe with one of those boys who had an older brother, and it was inevitable that one of them said, I'm going to tell my brother. And depending on the size of the older brother, right? or the fight in the older brother, you might back off in that moment. You always knew, when I was a kid, you always knew which kids in the, in, the, in the area had a big brother that you didn't want to mess with. And because you didn't want to mess with the big brother, you didn't mess with the kid. Essentially, that's what's happening with Haman here. <laughs> the Jews have a big brother. And Haman is messing with the Jews, and they... and. and and Haman doesn't realize from whom he's calling down the thunder. 
He doesn't realize the power of the one with, with whom he's picking a fight. Mordecai was little, but his God was not. This is a story that you see throughout the entire scriptures, right? Especially in the Old Testament, you get this lovely, interesting story about how the ark of God at one point was stolen and, and well, defeated in battle. The Philistines had defeated uh, the Israelites in battle and stolen the ark of God. The ark was a sign of God's presence among them. So it was essentially their way of saying, not only did we defeat you as people, we defeated your God. They took the God, Yahweh, they took his ark, they placed it at the feet of their idol in their idol's temple. Their idol was called Dagon. He was thought to be, of course, the greatest, most strongest God because he helped his people win a battle against Yahweh's people. So they placed the ark there in the, at the foot of Dagon. They closed the doors to the, to the room, went home, went to sleep, came back the next day. When they walked in, nobody had touched anything in the room, but Dagon, had his idol, this big statue, was bowing down in front of the ark. Well, that's embarrassing. So they prop Dagon back up, they go back home, they come back the next day. This time Dagon's bowing down in front of the ark, but his hands and his head are cut off. This can't be a good thing. And so they prop him back up and they realize though that as soon as this ark came into their area, all, everyone got tumors. And they think this is no coincidence. Something is dangerous about that ark. And so they sent it off to another city and the city said, yes, we will oversee it and we will proclaim our greatness over the God of Israel. But then they got all sorts of tumors and the city said, we don't want it. They sent it to another city and that city said, get rid of it. Don't bring it near here. Send it back to Israel. So they did put it on a cart, send it back with some gold, gold uh, sculptures of, of tumors. Lovely gift, yeah? The point of the story is that, listen, God didn't need anybody else but himself. By his own right hand, he was able to accomplish his ends. Don't mess with God's people. They've got a big, big, big brother. A strong big brother. Think about Pharaoh. Isn't that what happened with him? Ah, he's going to oppress the people of Israel. Moses comes and says, let my, God says, let my people go and... Pharaoh's like, no, nah, I'm not going to let anybody go. Who's this God that I'm going to obey him? He picked a fight with the wrong dude. Ten rounds later, Pharaoh's buried in the sea, having lost his children, and the greatest power in the world was shown to be Yahweh and not Pharaoh himself. Don't pick fights with the Lord Almighty or his people. The point in all of that is that God's plans for his people just can't be stopped. If you're, a, if you're a genuine follower of Jesus, God's plans for your good are guaranteed. It's not just that he's going to use the stuff for good, it's that it's guaranteed that it will be used for good. No one can stand in the way. Paul says this in the New Testament, uh, Romans 8, 38, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all creation. So God's plans for our good cannot be stopped. And here's the last one. Wait for the turn. I think this story teaches us what we ought to do in this present moment is, is wait for the turn. I said at the very beginning of this that little good was happening coming into this chapter, right? I mean, Haman had gotten permission to kill the Jews. Mordecai was massively in distress. He was moaning at the front, the front gate. Esther is risking her life. She had no guarantees that she was actually going to get what she was asked, had been asked. Nothing was really going that well. It all looked out of, out of control. It all looked like they were careening down the hill without any breaks. And then the turn. And then out of nowhere, without help from anyone, God showed up. Like in a palatable, real sense, his providence came to fruition in front of them. They experienced the turn from distress to joy. From sorrow to overwhelming victory. The turn. 
Look, I know that you and I, we wanna fast forward to the turn. Most of our lives, we're thinking, God, can we just get through this negative piece right now so that we can experience the next, next part? I've seen this movie before. Can we just fast forward and get to the turn, please? We like the deliverance part. We like the God coming through part where all the pieces come together. We like that part where we can see it and rejoice and sing our hallelujahs to God. But most of our time in this life is, waiting, is spent waiting for it. Most of our time is spent waiting for the turn, wondering if it's going to come. Look, let me finish by telling you that I, I was, uh, my son's car, his clutch went out uh, a, a few weeks ago, and uh, we had to get it replaced, but he, he barely got it back to our house, and I had no idea how I was going to get it to the, to the mechanic. The mechanic's... Uh, shop is just at the bottom of the hill from where I live. It's almost entirely down the hill. And I figured, listen, if I could just get it in first gear and ride for a little while and then try to take it down the hill, I could probably coast in. The problem is that there is, there is a light at the bottom of the hill. It's a, it's a major light in our town. And I didn't know what was gonna happen when I got there. Because if I stopped the car, it was gonna, it stalled and I couldn't get it going again. So I got in the car, went down the street, turned onto the main road, started to go down the hill, the car accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. I'm, I'm trying to get it, you know, it, I pop it out of first gear. I'm thinking to myself, well, here we go. And the whole time my, my, my heart starts to race and I'm looking at the light at the bottom of the hill, and it's red, it's red, it's red, it's red, it's red. And what you know what you're doing in that moment? You're just saying, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God. Oh, please, God, please, God. I wanted it to turn. I wanted it to turn. It didn't turn. It didn't turn. It didn't turn. Honestly, I nearly started to scream, please, God. But the moment I, I, I got to the light, it turned. Just at the right moment. I would have had it turn way earlier, would have saved me a lot of stress, got a few gray hairs because of, it, because of it, but right at the right moment, it turned, coasted right through, turned into the dealer or the, uh, the shop, parked it. I thought about that for a while. Most of our lives is, is spent on that hill, pleading with God that something will happen, pleading with God that the chaos that we're currently finding ourselves in, the careening down the hill, wondering if this is ever gonna work out. We're wondering if it's gonna actually end right. We're waiting for the turn. But I'm telling you that if God is true to his promises, the turn will come. I'm sure the people, the, the disciples, when Jesus was killed on the cross on Friday night, were careening down their own hills. But Sunday was on the way. So we wait. We wait expectantly. Or as Psalm 130 says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than a watchman waits for the morning. More than a watchman waits for the morning. Let me pray for us. Lord, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you are uh, good and righteous and sovereign and you work out all your purposes according to the counsel of your will. And we have to wait often to see them worked out. And we pray, Father, that we will see the goodness of our God in the land of the living. We pray, Father, that you will reach the turn with us whether it's through COVID or whether it's through the particular situations it's caused or whatever, Father, it feels like we've been going downhill, careening out of control for a little while, Father, we ask that you would change that light and you would help us to see your victory in our days. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for that challenge. We want to continue in worship now by giving. And the, one of the reasons we give is because what Jesus has given to us, we have an opportunity of giving back. And so we want to do that. We're so thankful for the church that has continued giving and even those of you that are joining online and giving. It's been great. Thank you.
Yeah, so we would encourage you, if you're part of Northview family, to continue mm-hmm. to give and to give generously. But if you're just a guest uh, tuning in, please don't feel obligated to give at this time. So we have a couple of options for you in terms of how you can give. First of all, you can text GIVE to the number that's on the screen below, or else you can go to northview.org, press on the GIVE button, and give that way. Have, with your like age and stuff, have you ever tried to do that? Or we can go to a check. Yes. option, and you can doing. take that check, fill it out, mail it into Northview, or else you can drop it off at the office in person during the office hours. Don't you still give just by cash? No? Okay. Anyway. I think we're moving on. We're going to join Frank now and the team as they lead us in a couple more songs. Sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you with compassion, love, and power. Come ye thirsty to the fountain. find his goodness here true belief and true repentance every grace that brings you
Thank you for joining us today. We want to leave you with a blessing from God's Word. It's found in the book of First Timothy. No, 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 no. Put the phone away. We're reading it from the book. Haven't I taught you anything? Okay, and it does come from 1 Timothy 1.17. It goes like this. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. I was yeah. just, okay, do you know what you're saying? Yeah. What are you saying? And make sure you subscribe to that YouTube. Oh no, we're subscribing to YouTube. So smash that button and all right. So make sure you subscribe to that button and <laughs> and make sure you subscribe to that like button and smash it. Smash it.
Okay, and make sure you subscribe and smash that like button. And it'll be lit up, buddy. Lit, just lit. Lit, just lit, okay. And make sure you subscribe to that like button, and it will be. Don't, don't subscribe. Subscribe to that just button. Just subscribe, just subscribe. And make sure you subscribe to that like button. No, you're not subscribing to the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it. Okay. And make sure you subscribe. <laughs> and make sure you subscribe and smash that like button. And it's gonna be lit. Wow. Good, good day. Thanks. Good, come along, come along, wife.